<laughs> I'm doing it for you for the camera, so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that. yeah, hey. <laughs> so, I'm used to making enemies, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Same. <laughs> anyway, so um, kind of just to review what we're talking about with the um, light skin privilege, the idea mm -hmm. of light skin privilege that I feel like is not necessarily as, uh, it's, it's similar to white privilege in that <clears throat> there's certain opportunities or um, uh, kind of like a listening ear or whatever that might not be there for somebody of a darker complexion. And as much as I hate that that exists, you know, um, I also see it as to some extent, like, okay, I've got, I have a responsibility to use whatever works. Like, okay, so if people are um, interested in participating and they're on that, in that process, because I think that um, becoming aware and becoming conscious of um, multicultural um, kind of, not just tolerance, but also acceptance and um, empathy with the other and kind of transforming that gaze um, I think there's a process of that and sometimes people get shut down when they're just starting because they say something that's kind of, kind of ignorant or whatever people just you know, blast them and then they stop and they don't they don't continue that growth and evolution and so I feel like perhaps I'm a safe place for people to come and kind of try out their ideas and see if you know that they're, they're gonna be encouraged along the way or you know what's going to happen. Um, so I try to notice when that's ha when that's occurring and see that as an opportunity where I can, you know, hopefully gently um, work with them and, and maybe reflect what's, you know, kind of in a, in a kind way. Say, you know, we don't we don't say colored anymore. It's kind of not, you know, mulatto is not a term that, you know, whatever has has been expressed. It's like, oh, <laughs> let's not do that again, you know, or. Um, oh, I just need to touch your hair again. It's like, hopefully that, you know, or ask, like, is your hair real or something like that? And you go, okay, just please don't do this to another black woman. You know, I mean, kind of as a first stop. Um, <clears throat> and so that, well, that's, you know, could be a, a, a form of privilege. It's also a little bit of a burden to be that bridge. And I do feel like that's um, a real part of my experience. Where that breaks down a bit is that I am very Afrocentric and I am very direct personality-wise, and I will say exactly what I think is right at that moment, and so that isn't as as much um, conducive to being a bridge. <laughs> I'd be like, oh hell no, you know, yeah. like uh, uh we just say, we don't go there. Um, but so I think that in certain issues, for example, my son. Um, in his school issues, if there are things that my children um, are affected by, that kind of um, mama bear personality comes up and it's like, this isn't going to fly. We've got to immediately shut this down and you know explain to people what's right and wrong in that sense of just justice. Where I'm able to kind of hear and be a little more flexible is, say for example, a woman who's experiencing domestic violence, a white woman, um, and it's you know on that path of healing, but she's just not you know, and she want to touch my hair. So like I'm not going to just be like, well, um, that's never okay, and I want to talk to you again, you know. But just feel like you know, kind of that's 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 something that is you know not affirmative and not helpful. Um, be happy to you know explain why or you know or like kind of move on. But so I think that um, for example my. My son recently was, he was just this week actually in their geography class, social studies, they were discussing Egypt, which is the only country or area in Africa that is going to ever be talked about in primary school in the U.S. usually. So, and they're kind of like discussing um, the Nile and the blah, blah, blah. Well, they're little, they got in a, a group of five students um, and they had the whole continent map theirs because they're kind of like seeing where it was and somebody was like oh well um, <clears throat> they they were like 
reading some of the other countries. <laughs> and the student was like, yeah, Nigeria, which was Nigeria, right? Okay. And Frank was like, ah, yeah, we don't say it like that. And, and everybody in his group agreed that that was the correct pronunciation. And Frank was just like, and I don't want to ask that. I don't want to tell the teacher about it because what if she also <laughs> didn't know? You know, and he's like, I'm just glad that we weren't focusing on the Niger River or the Niger Valley that day. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, true, you know, that would be kind of... That's funny, because um, when we went over it, they were like, <laughs> this is, like, specifically, like, this is not how this is said. Like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, wow. See, it, the it would have never like... <laughs> even occurred to me that that was a possible pronunciation of Niger, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, what? And then they all agreed and kind of, like, were... Like, you don't know what you're talking about. And of course, he's the kid of a black studies professor, so he's pretty confident that he does know. But he was just like, he didn't want it to be sort of a class wide announcement. <laughs> you know, so he just like, didn't. And so um, things like that really get to me. It's just like, oh God, you know, that's terrible. Um, another experience that he had recently was. And the, the Tea Party on Facebook kind of like called for the assassination, assassination of Barack Obama and his daughters and there are other like public, you know, uh, calls, so, you know, so-called for this and as terrible and disturbing as that is, I think sometimes we're like, oh, well, that's just all theoretical, that's just in the political realm. But it has local effects too because at school, one of his, one of my son's classmates is like, well, you know, you're never going to be a success, yada, yada. And he's like, yeah, I am. And he's like, well, if you're ever a success, I'm going to find you and assassinate you. You know, and for, for Franklin, he was just like, you know, he has an active imagination. So he's thinking, I can't totally picture this happening, you know, in, real, in, in his future. And that's, that's the kind of terror that a child shouldn't have to experience. And um, I think that, you know, again, me being stepping in and kind of trying to um, talk to administration, talk to teachers, get them to come up with some language where they can address these students um, as white people to white people, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, because I am probably not in the best position to be talking to the students, you know, uh, I mean, of an incident that's threatened my child. On the other hand, also kind of working with them to say, hey, I, I would be happy to come into your classrooms and give, since I'm a licensed diversity trainer and intercultural competency trainer, I have a lot of workshops, like prejudice reduction workshops, and um, like around the world in 60 minutes showing how certain things are normal that we don't consider normal in American culture, but they're normal other places, um, like not wearing shoes or whatever might be totally normal just based on climate or um, certain uh, social conditions, and so food and um, that we would think as, of as bizarre might be like a daily <laughs> diet, dietary um, experience in other places. So those kind of programs were really successful in North Idaho because I've built over years relationships with the teachers there. We've only been in Spokane um, since June, and so not quite a year. It's, it's been a really big challenge working with Franklin's new school to kind of get them to trust me to come in and do, you know, something with the kids that, I mean, even with professor status, but I'm a professor in a black studies program, so that's kind of like, that's I don't know. Too, yeah. Right, a lot of people <laughs> just assume that, okay, because it's black studies, you then do nothing else. And it's like, this is, but that's a misunderstanding about the program because it's an integrated study program. We don't because we understand what it is like to have our story eliminated from the history of America um, it's in the world in world history then I think that we're more conscious to be inclusive in the, the big picture when we're telling the story and uh, give credit where credit is due mm -hmm. along the process of those who have contributed to the cause um, of all ethnicities so there's some of that in terms of being being that bridge, you know, and um, even last night at the Girl Rising um, program, Gonzaga sent one of their professors from the Women's Studies Department, and then I was there, and it was just, you know, there's several, several
several times, like she kept asking me, so do you teach women's studies? And are you in a women? Have you ever been in a women's studies? I'm just like, no, but, um, you know, there are courses that are analogous or cross-listed, like the Black Women's Struggle. And I, I mean, it's not like I don't understand the female experience, yeah. but race, class, <laughs> and gender are always mm -hmm. intertwined. From everything that I do, those three are the top considerations, and you cannot split them. They are one because what happens to you based on your you know, being a woman and being a black woman and being a, a low wage uh, worker or a high, a high class uh, person or whatever is going to always impact everything that happens to you in your life. So you can't just isolate and just be this one thing for somebody and ignore those other aspects of your identity. So, um, but it's hard for some people to to train, because women's studies programs by 90 some percent, I think almost 94 percent across the nation are run by white women. Yeah. And it's almost like women are white, which white, the suffrage movement, feminism in general, was always, you know, women's rights, women's liberation, without pulling in the Alice Walker model of womanism yeah. with race, class, and gender considerations. Um, so it's kind of, you know, in some of those cases, I feel like I'm a bridge, but that also makes my experience a little bit more isolated, a little bit more lonely, because um, I'm not, I, I want to really do whatever I do for the good of the, the cause of um, deconstructing white supremacy, of um, encouraging greater life chances and opportunities for black people worldwide um, and locally and nationally. And so I think that sometimes I can play different roles in that process that are helpful at that moment, uh, but not all of those roles are typically played by all my friends, you know, so, um, and colleagues. So I think that sometimes it's like, okay, you understand this one part of me, but you don't really get the other pieces of the story. So, but that's all right, you know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, like I said, my kids know who I am, and I know who I am, and that's kind of where the full understanding sort of breaks down from there. So, no, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm.